As you've heard from the Archbishop himself, this is my second Archbishop Tabu Makaba lecture. I wasn't sure if the organizers had forgotten that I had presented this lecture before. And I wondered if maybe it's because they liked the previous one. Or somebody dropped them. <laughs> Well, the last one, I'm throwing it in because I once leaned on a friend of mine who was a judge. And um, he said to me, Send it to Lege Goba, ni way to Masenisa Lapagit at the last minute. <laughs> who has dumped you for you to remember to come to me at the last minute? <laughs> but he was a quintessential gentleman that was Pius Lang, and he did give the keynote, and it was a wonderful keynote. Well, last time I spoke about ethical leadership. Today I'm here to speak about um, Archbishop Tabo Mahoba's legacy in relation to integrity and ethical leadership. And the idea is to apply these lessons in the context of leading South Africa out of the maze left by state capture. There are parallels between Bishop Tabo Makoba, and many of the leaders have been asked to give lectures in honor of their integrity leadership. All of them have been epic leaders, and he is an epic leader. You probably think that I say he's an epic leader because of the epic footprint he has been leaving wherever he goes particularly around issues of integrity and social justice. But my reference to epic leadership is to leadership that is ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed to serve. His epic leadership puts Bishop Tabo Mahoba in the same leadership category as epic leaders whose memorial lectures I've given before. I've given, memorial, I've given memorial or legacy lectures in honor of epic leaders such as Oliver Tambo, Bishop Desmond Tutu, former Minister Dalla Omar, Albertina Sisulu, Helen Joseph, Helen Sussman, Charlotte McQuaige, Victoria and Griffiths. Charlotte McQuaige, Victoria and Griffiths. McQuaige, B.S. Nudir, and Adam Small. There's one thing that binds them, living their truth and leading ethically, purposefully, in an impact conscious and committed to serve way, no matter what. I would still like to give three legacy lectures though, which are on my bucket list. Do you know who is on my bucket list? Do you want to guess? I'm certain that you would not be able to guess because these are unsung heroes. I would like to one day to give a memorial lecture about Teddy Bessi, Priscilla Jana, and Zola Kesisili. They all inspired my quest for justice 
they all inspired my sense of the importance of integrity. They also inspired my sense of the invincibility of hope, which have been the hallmark of my life. Teddy Mpesi recruited me to the struggle at the young age of 18 and instilled an invincible hope that if we worked hard for change, tomorrow was going to be better than today. If we look back now, despite all of our complaints, today is better than yesterday. But think about somebody telling you that in 1980. That of course discloses my age, doesn't it? <laughs> think about Teddy thinking an egalitarian society was possible that apartheid was not invincible in 1980. Priscilla Jana believed in me when I was a bright-eyed 20-year-old law student, like many in this room. I was convinced that young people that were on the death row in Pretoria had been wrongly convicted through a combination of a poor or cross application of the, inform, in, of the infamous common purpose principle and poor legal representation. That case of the Becker star young people has always reminded me that poverty should not be a death sentence whether medically or in terms of justice. And in this particular case, Priscilla Jana believed that I was right, I wasn't deluded. She took up the case and she got them off the death row. They were already convicted. They were already serving this, the, this sentence and waiting to be killed. And then Zelaki Sisulu involved me in the trade union movement. And this movement has been a global torchbearer on social justice. And this year we're celebrating 100 years of the ILO. And one of the things the ILO did was to remind us that law without fairness was unjust. And it was labor law that started to question laws that we're supposed to be part of the justice system, but we're unjust, justice apartheid laws. And the church, and the entire faith community joined in, in leading the charge for social justice. And if you think about social justice, even the concept itself, it comes from the faith community, the Catholic community that a world that wants to be at peace with itself needed to embrace the humanity of every person, needed to ensure that there was a just and fair distribution of all opportunities, privileges, and burdens in society, as well as resources. Dear colleagues, the timing of our conversation today could not be better. We've just had the new book Dawn re rebooted through a relatively peaceful come. Sorry, I'm saying. We've just had the new Dawn rebooted through a relatively peaceful election. Elections, as you will agree with me, are a very important aspect of democracy. They may not be the only anchor of democracy, but it is through elections that people are able to express their will in terms of the policy direction that should be taken by government and in terms of who should be the stewards to take care of our collective resources and power. In an ideal world, we should all have a say 
on a daily basis regarding how we are governed and how our collective resources are dealt with. But it's impossible for 57 million people to all have a say on how their resources are managed. Well, even if you're not 57 million, look at the people in Malela and again reserve. They still are not able to have a say on how their collective resources are governed. And they've put a few among them to take care of those resources. Sadly, it's seemingly those people that they've put ahead to govern their resources are not people of integrity because I cannot understand why if you've been given a position of trust to look after our affairs, you wouldn't want us to know what's going on. We would need a court order, as happened recently, to get you to tell us what's going on with our money and our collective resources. But democracy has always been difficult. From 5th century Athens, when it took root, albeit in a rudimentary form, we still always needed a few among us to look after our resources and our power. And those had to be the most trusted and most trustworthy. The least selfish and the most competent. So the trustworthy part and least selfish boils down to integrity. And other people have spoken, but one self-employed young business person recently said to me, South Africa Incorporated has chosen its GCEO and board of directors. Would you agree that through the elections we chose our general CEO and board of directors, which is the president Indicative GCO because he's not the president yet. He still has to go to Parliament to be confirmed. The Board of Directors are members of Parliament and members of provincial legislatures. It is now left to Parliament to confirm the president as our GCO and choose its committee heads. Once the president is confirmed, he has to choose his own executives in the form of ministers and premiers. How should he choose these? On the same principles that we're supposed to choose the people we send to Parliament. The most competent, the most trustworthy, and the least selfish. Because if you can't trust me when I'm not on the other side, How can you trust me to look after your affairs when you're not going to be there every day? You can only depend on what I tell you. Even if you use Paya, you can't know everything that's happening on the other side. Paya is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. So you can only trust their integrity, really, that they would do the right thing. But there's something Remarkable that this young person said. He also said, we the people have put President Ramaphosa and the African National Congress on a final notice. Well, if you're a trade unionist, if you're an employee, if you're an employer, you know what it means to be on a final notice. It means you have had many chances to correct your ways, and this is the last chance you're being given to correct your ways. But in an article that I've written that will appear in the Financial Mail, I, I say something about people and elections. For example, this young person is saying They've given the governing party the last chance. Somebody else would argue, but there's been broken promises. 
there's been broken trust, there's been corruption, there's been state capture, there's been plain theft, there's increasing poverty, inequality, and many other dis disappointments. Why do people still want to give people the last chance? And often people say, analysts would say it's because people don't analyze. They vote according to their hearts, not their minds. You agree? My experience is different. And this young person that I dealt with, his name is Ulrich. He's a business person. No, he didn't vote with his heart. He voted with his brain. People do an analysis of everything else and then say, when you have a devil's alternative, what will you choose? We're here tonight to talk about integrity. But integrity is not the only thing people care about. If you're hungry and you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, somebody who comes here to preach to you about integrity will not be heard. You would want somebody to firstly talk about what's going to happen about the fact that you're hungry and how is integrity linked to the fact that you're hungry. So you don't want to philosophize when you're hungry. You want solutions to your bread and butter issues. That's been my experience. But secondly, I've also understood that human relationships are complex. I once compared voting to abuse. I ended up at the Human Rights Commission, where I said often voters behave like abused people. You keep hoping things are going to change. But here's the deal, sometimes things do change. How many people do you know who used to be beaten up and things changed? But sadly, for many things don't change, that's why we bury people who have been in abusive relationships. So basically this young person was telling us that they've been aware that things have not gone as required, but they think that in the circumstances the governing party has most of the elements that are needed to take us forward. But the question in everybody's mind right now is, will President Ramaphosa rise to the occasion? Well, given the, the fact that he is a chief co-architect of our constitution, his ascendance to the presidency can be likened to that rare occasion where you get the architect to be the builder. Because sometimes you get a very good design and then you give to somebody who messes things up by taking shortcuts. Many of us know about RTP houses. Those RTP houses were not drawn to break, to break down. There was nothing wrong with the architectural de design, but the shortcuts that were taken led to those RTP housings falling. Same thing with bridges that fall, same thing that happens with many other things that collapse. Former President Nelson Mandela used the fact that he was both the architect and the builder. He used that pole position effectively. He understood that to be worthy to all, democracy had to deliver an improved quality of life and free potential for every person, not just some, as my colleague said. He constantly reminded us that democracy had to expand the frontiers of freedom for all. The strategic approach he drove was making sure that all government decisions had to balance meeting basic needs with the country's aspirations 
to be globally competitive. My minister then, Dalla Oma, emulated Nelson Mandela in every possible way, exhorting us at all times to keep the Constitution in our mind as our Lord Star. He also was a co-architect of the Constitution. I remember vividly that Dalla Oma used to say that really for the people the taste of the pudding is in the eating. We can only know that we're doing the right thing if the quality of human experience at the interface between humanity and the state, particularly through the courts, was a good one. Today we talk sometimes about service delivery, which is we count how many things we did and the Auditor General said, you said we're going to do one, two, three, four, five things, you did them, clean audit, you go. But the question is, what's the impact? Are we meeting the constitutional promise of an improved quality of life for every person and free potential of every person? Not just some people. So what would it take for President Ramaphosa and his colleagues to succeed? In my view, it would take three things. One, understanding a commitment to the Constitution as the lodestar for all decisions and actions and choosing the right team. And what is the right team? It's one that has the right skills, right knowledge, right values, and the ability to work collaboratively with business, society, and the global community. The team would have to be persons whose track record is in sync with Section 195 of the Constitution. And I would say our talk today is really about Section 195 of the Constitution, the principles of public administration. And key among those is the principle that requires the public service to be of the highest professional ethics. And you can't have the highest professional ethics without integrity. You can't have the highest professional ethics without leadership, which is the ability or the art of influencing and inspiring yourself and others to think in a particular way and act in a particular way. Because to be able to consistently to do the right thing, you've got to lead yourself and you have to lead others. The leadership that will have to take us out of the maze will be a leadership that has read the EFF judgment on the Nkandla expenditure. Because key to this is ethical governance. I know a whole lot of people always look at the payback, the money part. The essential part of the Nkandla judgment is the importance of ethical governance for everyone who works for the state. The importance of public accountability and the importance of being guardians of the Constitution. We talk about courts being the ultimate guardians of the Constitution, but that means there are other guardians of the Constitution. The people who are being elected to go to Parliament are going to be our stewards. We won't be there, they'll be looking after our face. But we, as the people, still remain guardians of the Constitution. Ultimately, the agenda for change will be driven by these people, which is extremely important that they are ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and they're committed to serve everyone, not just the people who voted for them. And when I'm talking about service, dear colleagues, it's not just the people who are going to go to Parliament on the ticket of the ANC. It's everyone who goes to Parliament. Because if you only raise issues that concern you, you are betraying democracy. Because democracy says not all 57 million of us can be in parliament. We will elect a few. It doesn't matter who got you there, but once you're there, you're there for all of us. So each one of you, when you raise issues or when you move things, you have to do it for everyone. It shouldn't be just justice for you or justice for your constituency because that then becomes not justice, it becomes just us. 
What we need are people who go to parliament who transcend the just us paradigm, people who think about justice for all. And not because we owe you anything, justice for all, because you are in our place there. You're sitting on seats where all of us should be there, but those seats can't accommodate 57 million people. Because ultimately the agenda for change going forward should prioritize the healing of the divisions of the past and created a united nation founded on social justice and shared prosperity among others. That's the constitutional promise to all. The agenda should prioritize building a society at peace with itself and the rest of the world. None of this is possible without fidelity to the architecture underpinning our constitution. Integrity is not just about not lying and not stealing. Integrity is about purity, about wholeness. So when we're saying we want people of integrity to go to parliament, and we want people who will preserve integrity when they go to parliament, we're meaning people who will be true to their calling. And their calling is honor the Constitution. They would have all taken the oath, not about not stealing, but about honoring the Constitution, protecting the Constitution, and giving life to the Constitution. And what is the constitutional architecture that they must obey and drive the implementation thereof? The Constitution has a clear vision of society. It is a society where everyone's potential is freed and everyone's life is improved. It doesn't matter who you are. Your life should be improved and your potential should be freed. It is a society where the divisions of the past are constantly healing and a society based on social justice, <coughs> constitutional supremacy, and accountability. And it's a society at peace with itself and at peace with the rest of the world. The Constitution spells out in that kind of society in its preamble and section one. The Constitution also spells out the basic entitlements of the people and we know them in the Bill of Rights. They include civil and political rights, such as the right to human dignity, the right to equality, and the right to security of the person. They also include social and economic rights, such as access to food, access to water, access to health care, education, etc., access to housing. They also include the right to property in section 25, but that right is not given to only to those who had property in 1994. The right to property is given to everyone, hence that right includes the possibility of measures to redress the imbalances of the past. Having a clear vision of society, having basic entitlements of the people, the Constitution spells out the character of the state. It's a character of the state that respects human dignity, the achievement of equality, transparency, accountability, and supremacy of the Constitution. The character of the state also includes Section 96, which is about ethical conduct by members of the executive, which includes not having a conflict of interest. And we don't talk enough about not having a conflict of interest. People think that if, for example, you yourself are not involved in trading with the state, you have no conflict of interest. If my son-in-law is trading with the state, I do have a conflict of interest if I am in control of those resources. If a member of my church is trading with the state, I do have a conflict of interest if I'm in charge of those resources. And I don't think we've done enough to train members of government about the ethical requirements of their work. 
And often they get caught up in these things, as has happened in some of the reports that I ended up having to deal with. The character of the state also includes the duty to give priority to constitutional responsibilities. For me, it's a mark of integrity also to just think and say, in my budget, I only have two million. With this two million, am I going to organize a conference? Or with this two, two million, am I going to buy services or goods that will save the people? And one day we need to do an audit and say for every rand that we spend in the name of the people, how much of that money goes to the people? And how much of it is trapped inside the state and those who trade with the state and never reaches the people? But also for me, part of integrity is social justice. I used to live in a gated estate that is called Woodhill in Pretoria. Twice a day, there was a police vehicle doing a patrol just to check if everything is still okay. Twice a day. In addition to that, we had our own patrol. It's a gated estate that went around. Earlier this year, we had to go with the police, Department of Health, and, uh, and other service providers to a community called Emanzimeleni in Wazulu Natal. Forget about asking for a vehicle to patrol the village every now and then. They can't get one to come to the village when they call, when they're being raped, when they're being battled, when they're suffering all forms of violence. So where is integrity? Where is our fidelity to the Constitution when we are dividing every rand that we have a power to divide? We don't think about how much of this rand will benefit the left behind and how much of this rand will benefit those who already have a better life. So those are things that we have to think about. Why I'm raising that in terms of the character of the state is that there will come a time when those we have left behind lose their patience. In many parts of the world, it's already happening. And when I did the investigation on state capture, it became clear to me that you just needed to gaslight people about poverty. Those who were trying to stop the state capture investigation simply had to say there's no problem here except that these people are trying to protect white monopoly capital to your detriment. And people bought into that, at least temporarily. So the character of the state is a state that is anchored in section 195 of the Constitution, which is the values and principles of public administration is one that is anchored also in section 237, which is put constitutional responsibilities first and implement them with diligence. The constitution in the architecture also includes the structure of the state. We know about that, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary in chapter nine institutions to ensure that there are checks and balances to make sure everyone does the right thing and when they don't, there's somebody to hold them to account. But important uh, uh, for us to understand is that the accountability arrangements include you and me. The World Bank that has declared us the most unequal society in the world promotes a program called social accountability. That's where me and you come in to make sure that there is integrity within the state, there is accountability, and that things are done properly. But here is the deal. We don't want to deal with integrity when the horse has bolted. When somebody who was going to build a housing settlement 
and was given four million, uh, 400 million and they built one house, they've already been paid in their child money and sometimes they're already dead. Where you come to the free state, where money was assigned for the Winnie Mandela Museum, and you're talking about that as a problem in 2019. Social accountability requires you to check it every day and to empower people to check it every day. Why is that museum important? Have you ever thought about it? It has nothing to do with whether or not you like Winnie Mandela. It is museums are an important asset when it comes to tourism. So by failing to build that museum, you're not failing Winnie Mandela, even if you might dislike it. You're failing the people in that part of the world who could be using this asset to generate jobs, to generate income. Just a few days ago, we woke up to a financial mail article reminding us about the evidence of state capture shenanigans in state-owned enterprises. In this case, the article drew our attention to an affidavit of a whistleblower alleging that Regiment, a company implicated in state capture reports, not only benefited from corrupt contractual arrangements that included false billing, it also benefited from insider trading through leveraging its foreknowledge that Minister Nene's removal was going to cause ructions in the market. So going forward, these are things we have to make sure that they don't happen, that we send people into power who are not going to do these things, but that we are there to make sure they don't happen. Because what is the situation we have at the moment? We have a lot of hunger. Students here can tell you that all campuses are running some kind of move for food initiative or action for inclusion initiative to make sure that we end student hunger. But that hunger goes with anger, and sociologists then call it hunger. We have gross inequality, which is juxtaposed with opulence. Just the other day, the World Bank wrote an article that just says that 70% of all assets in South Africa are owned by 10% of the population. 70%. And then they say the bottom 60%, which is mostly black generically, that is African, Asian, and colored, that bottom 60% only owns 7% of the assets in this country. That is when you don't honor the Constitution. That is when you don't give priority to constitutional responsibilities. But what is the solution for President Ramaphosa when it comes to integrity? What is the solution for everyone who goes to Parliament, whether as governing party or sitting uh, on the sidelines, as in monitoring to make sure that there's accountability? Before I say that, unemployment, the statistics were released this morning, 27.6%, increased by one percentage point. If you add the needs, not in employment, education, and training, you don't even want to look at the picture. If you look at youth unemployment, you don't want to look into the picture. If you disaggregate it by race and gender, it even looks more ugly. So what can be done? The first thing, my message to those who are going to Parliament and the jobs that they're going to give to people in parastatals in all other places as custodians of our democracy, it should not be a job creation exercise. Don't give a person a job because they need it. Give a person a job because they're the most competent, the most trustworthy, and least selfish person. They must have the skills, they must have the values, they must have the knowledge required in that particular job. But there is a place that, where we can send some of the people who are ministers. I've thought of a plan, <laughs> just about to end here, dear colleagues, but I've thought of a plan. Um, in China, they have a commission for SDGs. These are sustainable development goals. 
In China, I read an article in the China Daily, which is very accurate about what's happening in China. The China Daily was saying in China, they have deployed some of the party leaders into all wards. In South Africa, we have 3,000, we have 4,392 wards. Imagine if we deployed people there to be commissioners. And gave them a mandate that you will just keep this job if you show progress every six months in terms of making sure that each of those wards makes progress on key sustainable development goals such as SDG 1, poverty. SDG 10, equality. Five, gender. And 16, access to justice, security and everything, because a lot of them complain about these things. And health, just get, give them for six months. So instead of creating jobs for the sake of jobs, make sure that we deploy them. 4,392 commissioners in all of the 4,392 votes. And then you're asking me, this sounds like a joke, who's going to pay for it? Well, when we had this dear president's project at Stellenbosch University and the Tuma Foundation, where we've been asking young people to write to presidents of, all, of political parties to ask them to close the gap between their intended agenda for action and the agenda for action they should be driving in terms of the constitution and sustainable development goals, one of the things young people suggested was we need to review the LOTO, how we distribute the money in LOTO. Some can be given back to those who contributed, but some of it could go to a deliberate sustainable development program. So maybe we could pay these people, I don't know. But that's something we need to think about. And talking about sustainable development goals and integrity, Bishop Makoba, I've worked for government for many years. I've worked with government for many years. I honestly think there's no integrity in submitting implementation reports to the UN on something you never implemented. I used to be in government, and when we do reports, we look at anything that we've done, and then we look at which box does it, fix, does it fit into, and then we put it. I've been trying to find out at the state, do we have an implementation plan for sustainable development goals? I'm yet to find one. But there are committees now that are being paid for to collect data to report on our implementation of sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goals are like a catalyst. To those of you who have been in laboratories, I believe everyone in this room has done a little bit of basic chemistry. So in chemistry, if you have um, elements that you want to mix together, if you add a catalyst, the catalyst is supposed to expedite the process. And ideally, after you've added the catalyst, you'll then have to see whether what you get at the end of the day is a compound which you wouldn't have got in but for the catalyst. So now, submitting reports on SDGs without having implemented SDGs is like measuring the impact of a catalyst without ever adding the catalyst. So my request, and we're offering our services as the M Plan on Social Justice and Social Justice Chair, and as the Tuma Foundation, to help those in government who want to make sure that they do have an implementation plan and they genuinely, honestly are implementing. Because this is our chance to deliberately end poverty, hunger, inequality, and ensure a sustainable environment. From our side, we already are doing it in terms of enterprising communities. We're going to these communities and saying, these are sustainable development goals, these are national development goals, this is the constitution, can you turn this into your own development goals? And then we'll link you to government and business to make sure that they join you in moving forward. That's why we are at Emanzi Meleni in Wazulu Natal, Lamini in Soweto, and we'll soon be in Kayamandi as part of our pilot. 
So what's the next chapter for South Africa, dear colleagues? My conversation with you tonight has been about looking at the life and work of, Pro, of Archbishop Tabo Makhova and ask ourselves what can we learn from his life. What I personally have taken from him is standing for his truth, leading with integrity, ethically, leading with purpose, leading with being conscious of the impact of every decision he makes or doesn't make, and leading in a manner that is committed to serve humanity from all walks of life. So if President Cyril Ramaphosa and those who are going to Parliament would like us to do better in terms of delivering on the constitutional promise in the next two years, because we don't have five years, he will need to take a leave or a page from the book of Bishop, Archbishop Mahoba, and all of the other leaders that have led before him ethically. He will have to make sure that he chooses a team that understands and is committed to the Constitution, understands the architecture of the Constitution. He would have to make sure that beyond the architecture of the Constitution, they clarify and crystallize the vision of what will look like in South Africa in five years' time, not in 25 years' time. He will make sure that the basic entitlements of the people then are clarified, the character of the state is clarified, the structure of the state works as it should, minor state capture, that accountability arrangements mean that everyone is not above the law, or nobody is above the law, regardless of who they are. But ultimately, he'll have to make sure that democracy works for everyone, not just a few of us. He will make sure that he leads with integrity, and in doing so, he must lean on all of us. But when need be, he should be prepared to walk alone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madutsela. Through years of experience, 